Good morning, good afternoon, depending which side of the Atlantic you are. I would like to welcome you to this uh, third um, Canada EU platform event uh, 2020 uh, on integration of migrant women. My name is Daniel Redondo and I'm a senior migrant protection and assistance specialist for the International Organization for Migration in our office in Brussels, Belgium, and I will be the facilitator of today's session. So as you know, we have a very excited, exciting and very um, relevant topic to discuss. So it's sex, gender inequity in health, focusing on migrant women. And we have been able to bring together a number of panelists and experts who are going to be sharing with us uh, their knowledge and their expertise in providing us with some concrete suggestions and also ideas on how we can overcome some of the challenges uh, that migrant women faced uh, in, this, in this field. So before we get started, I would just like to do uh, very quickly, uh, just a quick overview of some housekeeping notes. So um, I would just like to show you on the screen a few, uh, a few points, um, starting with the uh, French audio option. So in case you would like to tune in the uh, audio translation in French, you can just click on the right hand side of your screen, uh, the option traduction uh, audio en français. Uh, if you wish to use the English uh, closed captions, you can do so by clicking also on the right hand side, the option webinar, breakup room uh, information. Uh, just a few other details. So you have detailed instructions on how to access uh, for the attendees on how to access the platform in the on-air guidelines that have been uh, shared. And these are also available in the health section. If you require any technical support at any point, feel free to do it by contacting the live support, uh, which is located on the top right uh, of the webinar platform. Uh, the video plenary as well. So this can be enlarged for a full screen on the top right corner of the video. And the discussion forum is also available on the right hand side of the screen. So you can use it and connect with participants and the presenters as well. All right. So just uh, very quickly, this session is divided into three, um, three parts. So the first part would be the plenary, where we would be basically engaging with the experts with a few questions that we have prepared in advance. Uh, this will last approximately 45 minutes. Then we will move into the breakup room. So I'll give you the details later on, but we will have four breakup rooms. Um, so I'll provide the details, uh, as I said before, uh, later. And last, we're going to have the, the wrap up. So we're going to have the um, rapporteurs from each of the breakup rooms just to come up and present what the, were the main key points of discussion in each session, all right? So this is basically how the session is going to run. All right, so without further ado, I would like to introduce the experts of uh, the panelists in alphabetical order. So it is my pleasure first to introduce uh, Ms. Alisa Aravare who is a 26-year-old French uh, feminist from Moroccan and Algerian origins. Uh, she has a master in international law with a, a specialization in human rights and fundamental liberties. She is also a spokeswoman for the French uh, nonprofit organization, Ose Le Feminism, uh, Dare to be Feminist. And she's a project officer of the European Network of Migrant Women and a co-organizer of its young uh, women's movement uh, called Radical Girls. Alisa has also founded a theater company which uses art and pedagogy to promote equi equality between women and men. So I would like to thank her for being here. Uh, the second presenter is uh, Dr. Gianfranco Constanzo, who is a health director at the Italian National Institute for Health, Migration and Poverty of Rome, and also co-director of the WHO CC on Health and Migration Evidence and Capacity Building. Dr. Constanzo has experience in public and migrant health and international relations, which has been achieved during his work at the European Commission, Italian Ministry of Health, UNICRI, and IMMP. The third panelist I would like to introduce is Ms. Hori Hamboyan, who is a special advisor in the Department for Women and Gender Equality in the gender-based violence, uh, gender violence policy team at Status of Women Canada. Her work is focused on the federal gender-based uh, violence strategy and access to justice. She has attended McGill University, 
uh, and completed a master's in social works uh, before she joined the Department of Young Protection in Montreal. She also uh, became involved with the movement uh, Ontarian de Femmes Immigrant Francophone in a collaborative research project relating to the impact of armed conflict on migrant women. After graduating from law, uh, law school, she worked at Justice Canada for 12 years in family uh, law policy and family violence policy. Uh, the fourth panelist is uh, Ms. Daniela Machado, who currently coordinates the National Life Cycle Violence Prevention Program at the Directorate General of Health in the Director of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion in Portugal. The area of violence and discrimination against migrant people is one of the spheres of activity of the program. She graduated in clinical psychology and has been recognized as a specialist in clinical psychology and health and community psychology by the Portuguese Order of Psychologists. She has vast experience in primary health care in the areas of early childhood intervention, child and youth mental health, violence prevention in adults, voluntary termination of pregnancy, health promotion in pregnancy, and parenthood. And the last speaker is uh, Ms. Jennifer Watts, who is the CEO of Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia, ISANS in Canada, the largest immigrant serving agency in Atlantic Canada. ISANS provides a wide range of programs and services, including resettlement, language, employment, business de development, employer engagement, community integration, and online programs, both pre and post arrival. Trained as an urban and rural planner, Jennifer has a background in community development, urban and rural planning, and municipal issues, having served as a muni municipal councillor on Halifax uh, Regional Council. She is the vice president of the Atlantic Region Association of Immigrant Services uh, Agencies, ALISA, and a member of the National Settlement and Integration Council, and a member of the advisory board for the Nova Scotia Center for Employment Innovation at San Francis Xavier University. I would like to thank already all the panelists for their time and their availability, but also for sharing their expertise with us. And um, as I mentioned before, we have some uh, pre-prepared questions, so we would like to engage with them. And I would like to ask the first question to Jennifer, I hope that that's okay. Um, and Jennifer, if you can just, and this is the question also for all the panelists, um, what is the role of policy versus healthcare services in meeting the health needs of migrant women and girls. Over to you, Jane. Great, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to participate on this, pa uh, this panel. It is a, it's an honor and uh, I'm glad to be here with, uh, with, with, every, with everyone here. Um, I would say one of the key things from our viewpoint as a settlement agency, so working kind of on the front lines, is uh, the importance of policy uh, is that it actually embeds within government structures the direction that uh, that's the commitment of the government to move forward on. We can have really helpful and useful services and we have wonderful examples of how that happens in our own context. But what we found is that over the long term, unless the vision is embedded and is clear, then uh, then things can change, right? A lot can depend right now on the individuals that we're connecting in with at the medical services or the health services. But it, what becomes uh, uh, an issue for us is the long-term commitment and the direction that we're moving in and the ability to really effectively work as partners. So when there's clear, uh, consistent, transparent policy, which uh, is open for many people to participate in. So it takes into the experience of, uh, of, uh, of the clients, of the users of that service, as well as the settlement agencies. There's a sense of, of uh, direction and uh, the ability to really um, deal with some very difficult issues and emerging issues as they come up. One of the great things about policy, in my experience as a municipal councillor, that, you know, unless the budget is attached to the policy, all the greatest policy in the world is not going to make a difference. And so having that policy backed up by budget is going to really move things forward. So I, I could not myself underscore the importance of, uh, of that, both in terms of giving a clear picture of the direction, making sure there's opportunity for people to participate in that direction and to make sure that it's uh, fully funded. I, I have some other things to say, but maybe I'll just stop there as an intro. 
much, Jennifer, indeed. And I would like to ask the same question to Dr. Constanzo. So over to you, please. Um, yeah, um, it, it is uh, in, in Italy. Um, we got a, a very peculiar situation uh, as far as the uh, migration system or reception system is concerned. Um, we have very structured system in Italy, uh, which are very clear. A chain of command um, uh, among uh, the different actors uh, at national local level. Um, and uh, as far as policy is concerned, um, yeah, the, the, to us, uh, according to experience of the National Institute of Health, Migration and Poverty, which is the, the main public institute in Italy, um, uh, studying and proposing policies to, to, to the, to the um, uh, policymakers uh, is, for instance, to promote the overcoming of barriers to early detect vulnerabilities and to fully uh, take in charge uh, in the, the, the migrant women. Um, why this? Because, you know, uh, there are um, at least four kind of barriers to, for the access to healthcare services. Uh, which are uh, the cultural barrier, the economical barrier, and the linguistic, of course, and also administrative barrier, and um, and uh, also the, the 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 legal barrier. Okay, um, um, these barriers um, is something different from the entitlement to have, you know, the right to to access uh, the healthcare and also social social uh, systems. Uh, it is very much important to to understand in order to make those barriers uh, very narrow and uh, to mitigate the obstacles to access and then the policies at the national local level should uh, address these specific uh, points, these specific issues. Um, yes, we maybe after all we'll we'll take also some you know, you know, way to how to to tackle these uh, specific barriers, these specific obstacles, but of course uh, the training of operators and training of um, health uh, health operators and the health sectors, as as far and as well as the you know the the you know the the presence of uh, cross cultural uh, dimension dialogues with the with the migrant women in this case are really uh, important just to overcome this these problems in accessing the healthcare and social social care services okay, yes so it's important then to work at the various different levels indeed so i would like to hand it over to daniela so maybe she can share with us as well some experience from the portuguese perspective over to you i'd like to to thank the organizing commission, committee uh, for the invitation and all participants and the, the speakers who are, who are here. Um, first of all, I would like to, to say that, um, of course, uh, migration, and we are talking about women migration too, um, we know that this proportionally affects women, so it's very important um, we tackled the, the, the public policies uh, in uh, in health responses that must be sensitive to these gender uh, inequalities, uh, traditional female roles, uh, gender labor markets, gender based and intimate partner violence. Um, we think uh, effective measures um, uh, must be intersectoral and intersexual too, um, in order to be inclusive, uh, equitable, respect the specificities of the community, um, and above of all, being uh, sustainable. Uh, so, uh, in Portugal, um, we think, uh, we, uh, of course, we, we have too much to do in this sense. Uh, however, um, we are engaging um, to, to, to give all persons uh, the right to help promote, to help the protection, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, in accordance to, to the principles of equality, non-discrimination and equalization, the rights of all citizens. Um, our law uh, gives foreign citizens who legally lives in Portugal access equal treatment as a beneficiary to the National Health Service. Um, and for und und undocumented citizens are also granted access to health medical care uh, and um, exempted uh, on health care taxes 
uh, in situation uh, that could endanger public health. Uh, and in context uh, to the adoption of the public policies for the promotion of birth, protection of children, family support, immigrants in Portugal are granted on an equal basis re regardless their uh, legal, legal status, uh, like in family planning, child and youth health consultation to victims of violence, um, and also the exemption of the payment uh, of the health taxes. It's important too that um, uh, the law uh, establish that the uh, a family team in primary health care to all children up to 11, uh, to I'm sorry, uh, to 18 uh, years of age, which is a, a great um, measure to to include all all in the first uh, ages of the life cycle. Uh, so I think um, we have done this this uh, this um, pathway um, in violence prevention. Uh, all measures uh, are intersexual and intersexual too. Uh, we have the, um, the the measures are organizing by the national violence prevention program and life cycle, which included. Um, so, uh, particular attention to inequalities and vulnerable and uh, vulnerabilities uh, like migrants. Uh, this uh, this program uh, is uh, attains violence against children, domestic violence, gender violence, uh, uh, human trafficking, all uh, kind of violence uh, in a lifespan uh, perspective. Uh, we have now. Uh, health guidelines with protocols, flowcharts. Um, we have included these matters, including the migrants' vulnerability in the um, information system in the clinical records uh, of, of the users of the National Health Services. Uh, we have to uh, establish since 2008 uh, a national network of uh, about 500 teams, uh, multidisciplinary teams, um, to tackle uh, violence prevention in adults and in child, uh, which works locally uh, with the, the community uh, resources. Uh, so we think that um, we seek integrated sustainable intervention based on a uniform governance model. We think uh, it's important to, to, to have macro uh, but also micro um, micro um, measures. Much Daniela. So yes, indeed, we're looking into very comprehensive and very um, not isolated responses. So I think that's also extremely important. Thank you very much for contributing with that experience. Um, so I would like to hand it over with the same question to Alisa, and again on the role of policy in meeting the health needs of migrant women and girls. So over to you, Alisa. Thank you. Um, so at the policy level, we think first of all that um, migrant women should be better included within the decision process. So her specificities, uh, their specificities are actually uh, included in the policies. Uh, we also think that the approach should be multi-sectoral and that strengthening the coordination between the health system and other sectors such as a justice system, social system or the police uh, can actually improve the access to healthcare for migrant women. Uh, we also think that we need to identify clear objectives and indicators in order to monitor and to evaluate and to reassess uh, the policies. Um, then, we think that uh, specific measures should be entered because gender mainstreaming alone is not enough and we need speci specific measures in order to protect uh, migrant women and girls who are particularly vulnerable to some kind of violences. So for instance, we need uh, places in women-only accommodation facilities, uh, safe spaces for women and girls, spaces for confidential interviews with service providers alongside the presence of psychological support and translators, which is not provided enough. Um, then preposition portrait kits and contraception kits uh, in migrant uh, accommodation sites and also access to abortion, safe and uh, legal abortion and that kind of thing. Then another important thing is the collection of data and these data needs to be uh, disaggregated by sex, age and ethnicity uh, in order to enable policymakers to uh, develop evidence-based um, policies. 
Uh, and we also need specific data for underage girls because they don't exist a lot. We only have uh, data regarding women or children in general, but girls are specifically at risk of sex trafficking, post marriage, female genital mutilation, and a lot of uh, violences, specific violences. So we do need this uh, specific data. Um, then uh, as a policy measure, it seems to be very important to have uh, big campaigns to raise awareness and to promote equality between women and men because sex-based violence is uh, a big, a huge barrier for access to, to health, obviously, uh, for migrant women and girls. So it goes from stereotypes to intimate partner violence, uh, rape, sexual abuse, and so on. Uh, then we need to train all staff and guardians and foster families on violence against women and girls, including a uh, risk of sex trafficking, prostitution, child marriage, and that kind of thing. And finally, uh, as it was said before, uh, all of this needs to be funded. As activists, we are really careful um, when uh, decision makers announce big uh, changes in policies regarding migration or women's rights and they are not backed up with uh, finances, with budgets. Uh, we know that they are not going to be fully implemented and they're not going to be efficient. So that's also a big, um, a big warning. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. So I just uh, wrote down some notes because I think uh, there are important elements that have been also highlighted before. So um, the family household community approach, so I think that's also important uh, just to look into uh, the individual. Uh, of course, the individual, uh, particularly when we speak about participation and also, as uh, also Jennifer mentioned, uh, as a, having a, a client center, if I can call it like that, or, or a specific um, individual approach as well into, in terms of the specific needs. So we see already some cross-cutting aspects in here. Maybe also from Harry's experience, if you can share a little bit of your insights with us. Over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure being here. I echo a lot of the sentiments that have already been expressed. From a federal, Canada's federal government perspective, I would say one of the most important um, efforts that we can do is continually work in collaboration. As Alyssa was saying, you know, really a strong multi-sectoral approach. We work very closely with our federal counterparts at the Public Health Agency of Canada who coordinate the federal government's family violence initiative. Uh, Gender-based violence is very much a health issue, um, both mental health, physical health, and otherwise. We also work very closely with Canada um, Mortgage and Housing Corporation on housing, you know, long-term affordable housing. Of course, violence against women's shelters are crucial, but long-term affordable housing is extremely important, especially for those who are most at risk, which would include newcomers, immigrant and refugee women. Um, we do a lot of engagement with experts in the field. That is also an absolute central focus. We absolutely need to hear from the experts in the field, both survivors as well as advocates and organizations working with refugees, immigrants, and other at-risk populations. We need to know where the gaps are. We need to know where the best practices are. We need to be able to fund and perpetuate these best practices in all fields. We need to take into consideration areas that have been traditionally underfunded. I mean, a lot of these areas are underfunded, but we have approached organizations that work with women who have experienced female genital cutting. Um, the Public Health Agency of Canada has provided funding for an organization to um, look at increasing training for healthcare providers to be able to adequately work with women who have experienced cutting. That's a really important area that um, has been overlooked. Um, as was mentioned, I work on the federal gender-based violence strategy, and this includes all forms of gender-based violence, and we look at all aspects. We work very closely with our counterparts at the Department of Justice as well. Somebody mentioned policy and laws. Those are absolutely important um, to ensure that the policies and laws are strong and robust. 
but we also need to look at how those policies and laws have an impact on the ground. Sometimes there are unintended impacts that we absolutely need to take into consideration. So again, the whole notion of ensuring that we have communication with people who are experiencing the policies. Where are the gaps? Where, where are the unintended um, uh, effects? And what needs to change? Um, we work very closely with our provincial and territorial partners as well, as well as um, our partners at Immigration, Refugee, Citizenship Canada and Global Affairs Canada. Again, research, data, all of this is all very important as well for us to have a sense of where the gaps are, where the needs are. We're also now in the process of developing a national action plan to end gender-based violence. Um, and this is an approach where we are in partnership with various sectors and we have to absolutely take into consideration the impacts of policy and how to improve policy for people who are most at risk, including uh, immigrant and refugee women and children. Thanks very much, very indeed. I think evidence-based uh, approaches, I think this is also very important, consider the impact um, on migrant, migrant women and survivors in this case, I think it's also relevant. Um, building on partnerships and collaboration. And on that specific point of collaboration, I think I would like to ask the second question. And I'll start again with Jennifer. Just to share with us what are some of the ways um, that collaboration can bring different sectors together uh, at the government's, governance levels. Uh, for example, health and settlement, institutional and community, to meet the needs of migrant women and girls. So how can we bring them all together and on board? Over. Yeah, so I think it's a commitment on the part of, uh, you know, the agencies and the service delivers to work in, in, uh, in our case with uh, settlement providers. We have a, a wonderful example here in Nova Scotia uh, of the Newcomer Health Clinic, which was established where we worked with the Health Authority, Nova Scotia Health Authority, uh, one of the local hospitals and uh, with ourselves and some other partners on the ground in really uh, identifying what were the needs of immigrant women. So being clear about that and offering very specific services and programs that met their needs. So where they had the opportunity to go to the local hospital, uh, to have an experience of what that uh, engagement was about, you know, the Well Women program and also support around, uh, uh, you know, prenatal, postnatal birthing, uh, um, you know, uh, programs and opportunities. So th that very kind of uh, specific development of programming that then can move, uh, can continue on is critical because one of the uh, big things that we're finding is the ability for our, our the people that we serve to have access to information that feel that they're empowered to make decisions. So we work from an empowerment model. So being able to work in, in, in uh, collaboration and relationship with uh, government partners that understand what that empowerment model is and how important it is to be able for people to access information. Um, the other, I think, uh, thing that's really important for us around uh, the ways of ensuring collaboration is, is having, um, you know, the um, information, disaggregated uh, information about who's, who's being served, because one of the things that we have a hard time uh, understanding sometimes, even as a settlement agency, is all of the information about our clients. You know, having well, uh, you know, developed database systems that provide that disaggregated, um, you know, uh, collection of uh, or information about who our clients are and where they're coming from is sometimes hard for us to develop. But if our government partners are unable to provide that information as well, it becomes very difficult to have that very evidence-based uh, approach to the delivery of service. So I think the, from our viewpoint, the support of our government partners in really developing those systems themselves, providing that information and ensuring that the, that the organizations they work with have the ability to do that as well is really key. Um, the other thing perhaps I'll just mention as well is, um, you know, the collaboration is, is a commitment to trauma-informed approach, uh, particularly working with, uh, with uh, immigrant women uh, and girls is really important. Uh, so making sure that we really work hard to make sure our staff have that training, but also that that training is happening and that approach is understood with, it, with our partners whom we work with, so that we all are kind of coming to the same starting point and understanding when we're talking about the development of programs, we're starting from a place that is trauma-informed, that uses an empowerment model that really respects
folks the opportunity to make sure people understand and have the information so that they can make the best decisions for themselves. That's kind of key in our, you know, from, from the ground as a settlement agency, one of the very important things for us. Much indeed. I think empowerment is a very important word and important effort to, to, to do in this field. So thanks very much. Um, so Gianfranco, over to you. Um, the, this specific point and um, uh, bring us to, to discuss about the you know the organization of this of the of the state uh, um, responsibilities uh, level and in fact it will depend very much on the structure of the responsibility at the state level. Um, you know there are some uh, countries in the state is, states uh, such as Italy, for instance, they have clear responsibilities as I told you before, and uh, the organization of the reception system is uh, within one or two big state uh, organizations, the Italian Ministry of Interior, the Italian Ministry of Labor and Social and the Social uh, Affairs. And um, in this specific uh, cases, you 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 got um, uh, to 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 push on on relationship uh, among among uh, uh, different actors and, and institutional actors and players. Um, there will be at the center, for instance, in Italy, there is the the public body, um, you know, uh, providing all the reception system and, and all the reception uh, facilities. But then you need also uh, to involve uh, the third third sector bodies uh, because uh, the the real empowerment of uh, the, the women and the girls, migrant women and girls, is only achievable um, with a huge uh, activity uh, made uh, by by the public bodies, the public responsibilities, but also the, by, by the partnership, the private uh, partnership. Um, for instance, uh, talking about um, girls and, 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 and migrant women, in Italy we, we had, uh, have a, a national project which is called the Women's Health Project. And um, th this project tried to put together a very wide partnership, public-private partnership, in order to solve some problems which are related to violence and, uh, you know, trafficking, exploitation of um, women and girls um, um, uh, having a, a direct, uh, you know, effect on the um, um, inequalities and, and 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 the fact that may, most most of the times the girls and women they need equal access to social services and health services and also uh, they don't have the same possibility to to denounce or to to react to these specific points. And we tried to put together, uh, for instance, the, the public health services, the third sector actors, and also association providing legal support, and also the police officers as well. So the networking is really central um, in our understanding, in our experience, because, because only uh, um, with a close cooperation, different governance level and responsibility levels, you can approach as so intersectoral uh, problems, which are uh, most of the times the needs of migrants, women, and girls, um, the uh, in a one in a one way, uh, moving from the silos approach, uh, which is very clear because uh, it, it's guided by the responsibility criterion, uh, to the intersectoral. Um, uh, activity. So all the problem, all the projects uh, pushing on the intersectoral uh, cooperation are very good uh, activity just to overcome these specific problems you, you can experience in all the countries and all the states um, regarding the, for instance, violence and trafficking and, uh, and so on and so on. So you should give the possibility to women to to denounce to 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 cut the 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 you know the relations with the exploiters pe exploiting people and so on and so on. So uh, another point in Italy, for instance, and all the other countries in Europe is given by the AMIF um, fundings, which is uh, devoted to asylum and uh, refugees uh, um, uh, people. And so there are many activities. 
um, projects in, in Italy um, funded, for instance, through this fund, the European fund, which is uh, managed at the national level, for instance, to overcome language barriers. This is very clear. So Italian, the uh, people, they are learning Italian, women and girls uh, once arrived as newly arrived migrant people, they just, they are put into paths uh, just to understand the national language, because this is uh, the first, the prerequisite to, to express uh, the empowerment and also the rights of the, of the of people, of any people. And also, for instance, another, another project which is, which has proven to, 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 to function uh, is uh, just to have best practices in promoting um, social and economic integration in the host country. Uh, this is not very closely related to the immediate need of women, but uh, they are prerequisites just to put all those women in the condition to exercise their right. So I think we, from one side, we have to to act very close to the needs, just to denounce, to make women denounce, just to you know to have the full and, and direct access to social and health services and so on and so on. But on the other side, we ask also to ensure and to make sure uh, that women can exercise their right because some of them, they have a legal right when they are in the, in the country, but they don't know, simply don't know how to express that right. So the other point is just to, you know, to, to work a little bit, you know, uh, far from the, the real needs because they are the prerequisite just to, to assure that women are empowered and they are free to to do their 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 path Franco yes and especially in this time of covid-19 where we see uh, trends increase um, of vulnerabilities no and some risk factors that have come up uh, so i think this is also extremely important so daniela if you can please share also some insights from the experience you have thank you thank you um, I agree with all all that was said. Um, the the commitment of um, all public, social, and um, private sectors are absolutely um, needed um, to uh, in order to avoid the spread of uh, intervention. That um, most of all with the, with the, the the women and the migrants. Uh, has tend to to promote uh, revictimization and uh, and attempts of uh, human rights. Uh, so we have to strengthen institution in a common work at uh, as as we said at uh, different levels uh, at the macro level at the regional level at the micro level. It's very it's very important. Uh, it was said here to the the importance of. Um, uh, giving, uh, hearing the voice, the, the voices of the ma migrant women and the migrants in in uh, promoting their rights, um, all all uh, with uh, with their commitment to um, uh, that's the path. Um, so networking obviously is uh, fundamental um, to recognize the, the specific needs of uh, migrant. Uh, people um, in in a in a macro level, I would like to 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 say that in Portugal we have a a, a large um, a large uh, migration uh, migration strategic plan. Um, it was created by the it was organized by the High Commissioner for Migration with another uh, uh, with all sectors: social, uh, education, health, um, police. Um, it is very important that the the, um, the several uh, measures uh, included uh, would be practiced in in local uh, so so to be uh, effective. Um, we, we in in health we are working with um, this this high commissioner has a local network. Uh, uh, migrants integration support center uh, and and uh, the um, the health sector has been um, working uh, uh, closely yeah, that's very important um, and then uh, another thing important i think too is um, we have um, 
in uh, in uh, in all centers, in all health centers and hospitals, uh, we have a citizen office to promote citizen rights, uh, duties, registration to help to registration support, access to care, um, also complaint management. Um, we have to. Uh, social service professionals not in all all service but in in most of all uh, who established this community uh, the, the community um uh access uh, in case of need like uh, with social institutions social security service local authorities uh, immigrant support centers and i think that's that's very very uh, important in the area of violence prevention we have to uh, a national uh, plan a strategy in uh, non discrimination and equality uh, which have three specific plans also like the the migrant plan um, in uh, in three major plan in three major uh, areas equality between women and men uh, violence against women and against uh, and domestic violence and uh, sojis in the uh, sojis areas and i think that's uh, that's very important that uh, the institution uh, know about that plans uh, to to in order to to being very practice uh, that measures i don't know if i explained so well <laughs> i'm sorry very well understood thanks very much daniela now we'd like to also ask uh, Huri on this same, qu same question. So how the various levels can collaborate to meet the needs of migrant women and girls? Over to you. Thank you. And again, thank you all for your very uh, rich um, contributions. I'm learning a lot. Um, from a very practical perspective, we try and hold regular meetings with our provincial territorial partners as well as all the federal partners we have working on the gender-based violence strategy and working together in the development of the National Action Plan to End Gender-Based Violence. As I mentioned, and as has been echoed, um, research data is all very important. My minister has an advisory council um, that she meets with on a regular basis, and that comprises of uh, various experts, researchers, professors, su survivors, and different stakeholders. And we also host engagement sessions. Again, it's a really it's really important for us to listen, to listen to the voice of people who are affected by policies and laws to get a better sense of where the gaps are, where the needs are, and how the government needs to respond. Our overarching plan to develop a national action plan will be developed in partnership with provincial and territorial leaders as well as experts and the hope is that we will be able to address the needs of people who are experiencing gender-based violence and with a particular look at those who are most at risk which includes migrant women so once again um, i echo many of the things that have been just said and you know including promoting trauma-informed practices, ensuring that we are funding and disseminating best practices. And we also host a knowledge center um, where, where we attempt to ensure that best practices, trauma-informed practices are disseminated and accessible for people. Awareness is really important. Uh, we work with public, with our colleagues at Justice Canada to develop public legal education information um, on various issues related to gender-based violence and family violence. We also do our best to attend, you know, events such as this and um, conferences and learn as much as we can, both domestically and internationally. We have great collaborative work with different countries as well on specific issues. And um, a lot from other. Yeah, and I think it's a it's a very good uh, suggestion. No, for a collaborative approach. Um, so, Alisa, let me ask you the same question. So, if you can share some insights on your end, please. Thank you. Uh, so, I also agree with a lot that was already said. Um, we think that health access to health should not be considered alone when it comes to migrant women or any women for that matter it's 
part intertwined with every other aspect uh, of life. So it's directly linked with access to rights, access to information, access to education, access to food, obviously, and water and a good environment, access to accommodation. So that's why it's so important to have this multi-sectoral uh, approach. Uh, for instance, if we take the case of accommodation, uh, I mentioned before the uh, single sex facilities, the need for that, it's very important important. It's actually stated in the Istanbul Convention and a lot of European countries are not respecting it according to the Grivio report. Um, it's important because uh, there is risks of uh, re-traumatization, there is risks of sexual abuse and uh, rape, um, and actually a lot of women in uh, mixed facilities are victims of male violence. Um, or they fear to be victims of male violence because they actually flee such violence and uh, uh, it can create a climate of fear. So yeah, that's uh, directly part uh, of the health uh, issue. Uh, then what is also very important is to train everyone in every sector that, that is involved and this training needs to also be uh, comprehensive so you need legal ex aspect you also need uh, some consideration of traumatology of psychology of sociology and uh, these comprehensive training should be provided in every sector that is uh, in contact with this public so whether it is uh, in the health sector but also social services the police and so on and they all should work together um, uh, in implementing a good uh, a good policy um, what is also very important is to have specific action for women because um, we saw for instance someone mentioned the AMIF fund uh, from the European Commission uh, we actually made a report the European Network of Migrant Women made a report about um, where uh, to whom this money actually goes on the ground when it's uh, implemented through the projects that are funded. And women benefit way less than men um, of all of these projects because it's harder to get access to them uh, because of uh, language and cultural barriers and stereotypes and uh, sex-based violence and so on. So in all of these projects, we need to have specific and concrete measures that are targeted directly towards migrant women and girls. That's very important because otherwise they don't get access to, to the policy, even though it might be good. Um, yeah, we also need uh, research and data to have this evidence-based uh, policy, as I mentioned before, and several other people also, uh, also said so. Um, and we also need to simplify uh, all the procedures uh, that give us access to, to the facilities, whether it's uh, mental, for mental health or, or health in general, because uh, right now there are some unnecessary procedures or complicated ones. There is also the barrier language. Uh, there is not enough effort that's put in translating and disseminating all of the information regarding the procedures. So yeah. All of these efforts should be made, and I won't be too long because a lot was already said. Very much, you know, and I think uh, some of you have already introduced an important part of the discussion, which is um, the uh, the way how we can make these services uh, and the support also uh, culturally sensitive and also mindful of the needs of migrants. So as we are also trying to wrap up to move on to the breakout rooms, I would just like us to br very briefly to each of the panelists, if you can just share with us something very, very quick as one key recommendation that you would have on how to address cross-cultural understanding in the health sector, avoid bias and xenophobic practices in the delivery of health services. So maybe let me start with Alisa with a very concrete suggestion. So we mentioned, we all mentioned this training that needs to be done. And as I was saying before, the training needs to be comprehensive and there needs to be a disconstruction of stereotypes. And it's not only sex-based stereotypes, it's also um, racist stereotypes. Uh, and that's also why we need uh, an intersectional approach in designing these trainings and toolkits uh, for organizations and uh, public uh, instances, public um, bodies 
uh, to use. We need to be intersectional and to have this acknowledgement of uh, the intersection of discriminations that are faced by migrant women and girls. So that would be the recommendation to focus on this intersectional aspect while designing the trainings for all of the people involved with this public. Much, Corey. Corey, over to you. Yeah. Very quickly, I agree with what Alyssa just said, intersectional approach, uh, gender-based analysis, um, engagements, continual engagements, uh, hearing the voices of the people most affected and most at risk, and funding um, women-led um, or people who are affected, survivor-led approaches. Uh, Jennifer? I would say making sure that staff are hired that represent the wonderful diversity of our community. So the training is key, but also and in our case as well, we have boards that oversee many things that, uh, you know, provincial boards, that those boards also reflect the diversity because those are the ones that really ultimately set the policy and the, and the budgeting exercise. So it's not just who are the frontline workers, which is very important, but also those boards and decision makers reflect the diversity, again, of, of our communities. Okay, Daniela? Um, I think it's um, everything is uh, said, but uh, I would like to focus the, the literacy um, uh, in in this in this kind of, of matters. Um, we have to work in proximity networks. We have to establish good practice in humanization, um, like like was said in uh, in evolve um, staff in. Uh, Truly, training programs that um, that uh, work specific health needs, diversity, cultural mediation. It's very important inside of of um, of health uh, of health services. We have to uh, social cultural mediators uh, to foster migrants' participation, uh, involvement, integration. Um, so to strengthen the confidence in service, removing barriers. Uh, and so on and so on. Uh, I think it's important to to conduct intercultural meetings at the local, regional, and national level levels, um, so we can uh, hurt every everybody who is uh, involved. With the same question, uh, John Franco, go ahead, please. Uh, many things have been said. However. Uh, coming back to the the main barriers uh, for for the the migrants uh, just to access the 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 health sector because we are talking about the health sector. Um, having said that, the health sector is not a silos, but is something related to connecting many other sectors. Uh, but um, you can't do anything um, appreciable. Uh, if you do prepare the health sector operators just to understand the needs, properly the needs of, of migrant people and uh, in this case of migrant women and, uh, and, uh, and girls. Uh, it means that uh, you have to prepare a curriculum uh, at the university level for the health operators, uh, for, for the health staff, because they have to have the the you know the the tools and the instruments to understand uh, really understand the needs and the, to 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 to, uh, to manage those needs in the clinical setting, uh, but also it, it is important to me uh, that you offer also different um, professional in the clinical setting. For instance, in Italy, we developed a a curriculum for transcultural mediators, uh, expert in in healthcare. And it is very important because it's uh, it's a 120 year, uh, hours of a curriculum, 80 in presence, 80 hours in presence, to 40 hours in the, in the practice. And um, those uh, transcultural mediators they are really important because they represent the bridge uh, between uh, the the needs and also the understanding capability of uh, the health professionals, and they help. The, the, the setting understand and also systematize the needs uh, in order to give a proper reply to the to the the health problems of the person and um, last uh, least but last um, 
also the valorization of the anthropological points of uh, which are put um, very uh, frequently uh, in the clinical setting. We have also at the INMP uh, in Rome, we have anthropologists, uh, we have also medical anthropologists uh, to, to study in depth the uh, specific and peculiar cases which need uh, to, be, to be studied and researched. So I think the, the, you know, people, they have to be empowered, but also the system has to be um, made uh, capable and ready to accept and understand the needs and health of migrants. Thank you very much to all of you. I think these are really, really good suggestions and very concrete examples. And before we go to the breakout room, I would like just to once again thank each of the panelists for sharing with us all, all of your your experience and very insightful uh, points of view on these uh, different topics. And maybe just in a minute or less, if each of you can just um, maybe let us or share with us how governments can mitigate the differential impacts of COVID-19. Uh, that we're experiencing, uh, particularly on migrant women and, and girls. So let me start with Jennifer, please. Thank you. Uh, I think essentially it's a very careful listening to what is happening because this is such an unusual situation that's happening for us that we got thrown into very quickly. As a frontline settlement agency, we are learning on the fly. And, you know, it's not only the people that we're serving, but also our staff that are, are living that trauma as well in terms of the impact. And what is really important, I think the key thing is that that between the government uh, agencies that are providing the services and the people that are working directly with uh, the people that, that we all want to serve, there's open communication, there's constant readjusting of changes, there's budget support. We are very grateful for the support we've seen uh, over the past you know, eight months in terms of being able to provide service. So it's, it's a really um, wonderful example, I think, in Canada, what we've experienced is, that, is an intensity of understanding what is your need and how can we support you and being very proactive. We've had a very good experience of that and it's been very important for us. Actually, any further with the same question for Alisa? So, uh, one of the first thing is um, translating all the measures. All these new measures are even more important than usual. Uh, so, they need to be translated in every language uh, so the migrant communities can have access to it and uh, specifically migrant women and girls. Uh, there is also the idea of um, making people and sectors accountable, holding them accountable. For instance, in Spain, uh, the agricultural sector has not provided the seasonal migrant workers with uh, adequate equipment to protect them. So we know that a lot of Moroccan, thousands of Moroccan women are coming every um, year, every summer in South of Spain to collect the strawberries. Uh, this year, they were not provided with uh, any equipment and the COVID disease spread uh, widely um, in this community as a result. Uh, we also need to have a specific focus on uh, the fact that domestic workers are being either fired so they're losing uh, money and accommodation in the context of pandemic, uh, but they also, um, at, uh, as an opposite consequence, uh, they can be held in the, um, in the place of work to avoid the transportation and the risk of spreading the disease, and therefore they have a lot of... Um, supplementary uh, hours that are not being being paid and they have to sleep uh, at their place of work um, and they have a workload very heavy because there might be uh, sick people uh, they may not be uh, provided with the right equipment so there is very heavy consequence uh, for them and there is also the idea that everything that's you uh, usually put into place to help uh, migrant women in dangerous or at risk situations is being posed right now because of the situation. So, for instance, in the case of sex trafficking, um, it's uh, becoming harder and harder to actually identify the victims, to provide help to them. Uh, some uh, 
facilities, um, single sex facilities and accommodations are closed. Uh, emergency shelters are closed. So yeah, uh, it's understandable in uh, from one point of view to avoid for the disease to spread, but women, migrant women and girls are also, their lives are also at risk for other reasons and this need to be acknowledged and taken into consideration in the measures that we take. And uh, finally, I think um, the money is key and uh, we have now uh, these emergency budgets that are allocated to private sector or enterprises or cultural sector and so on. It's being distributed to face the crisis and some of it definitely needs to go to women's rights specifically um, and even more to migrants, uh, women and girls because they are even more vulnerable to the violence and uh, discriminations. All right, thank you very much, Alisa. Uh, Hori, also very concise. How sure. can governments mitigate the differential impact of COVID-19 on migrant women and girls? Yeah, thank you. So as we know, the pandemic has not caused gender-based violence, but we certainly have seen the increase in its impact, partly because women who have been experiencing intimate partner violence are being told to stay home and many of them are living with violent partners. Access to services, access to informal um, support systems has been seriously curtailed, whereas many people would turn to neighbors, extended family, friends, places of worship, those places have all been shut down. Um, emergency shelters have not been shut down. Many people don't know that, but certainly the shelters have needed a lot more funding in order to be able to prevent the spread of COVID if an outbreak were to happen in their centers. And so the government did respond with some emergency funding to violence against women's shelters as well as sexual assault centers. And, and uh, there was awareness that these supports were available. very much for her. Daniela, over to you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, health, although uh, overloaded in, in, this, um, in this phase, uh, is uh, um, at the forefront uh, in, together with, uh, with the users so, and, the, and the people and the, and the population. So I think um, in, this, in, this, um, in this pandemic, we, we seek to dissemination all kind of resources, uh, namely in the, in the area of uh, um, interpartner violence, gender violence. Um, in Portugal, it was created uh, more, more um, home shelters uh, to ensure um, the, the, the victim uh, protection. Uh, we have uh, we have associated with um, with uh, the the national network for support to victims uh, of domestic violence. Uh, so in the in this we have a, a website uh, in health. Uh, all uh, some materials uh, has been uh, translated uh, by the um, by the high commissioner of migration. It was very very important. Um, it was pub we published to uh, we think it's a very good. Practice practice a technical health guidance for professionals uh, which um, work with migrants, refugees, uh, to flexibilize the, proce the procedures um, to, to obtain in the, the national health service user number uh, to, to grant that there is um, access to the national health service and other health care service. We have uh, encouraged the use of uh, cross-cultural uh, mediators. We have um, uh, uh, disseminated the, the migrant helpline uh, and uh, to where there is uh, very language barriers. We have reinforced implementation uh, of contingency plans that allow accommodation, food and hygiene and health, um, uh, inclu including through partnerships with the communities and association of migrants and Roma communities. Um, that I think it's, uh, it was uh, very, very important because we don't know uh, where, uh, what time it's during the pandemic. Thanks very much, Daniela. And Gianfranco as well, if you can just be brief, over to you. 
Thank you very briefly. Um, of course, COVID-19 epidemic has put uh, a tremendous challenge to, to the health information systems at, at the governmental level for migrants. Uh, because we, we need at the governmental level to stratify the information uh, on the uh, migrant population and in this case of migrant women and, uh, and girls. So it is really important just to have information and to understand the phenomenon. But uh, in this specific point, you know, the COVID-19 put some precarious working conditions to to the to the to the women, and also uh, it put some more barriers in receiving the proper information, accessing dedicated COVID-19 health services. And uh, for instance, in Italy, we we have structured a national site just explaining in other languages, many languages, what's going on with all the regulations and the laws and the and you know the acts at the governmental and local level, as well as the, you know there are some jobs at high risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection. For instance, in the indoor jobs for migrant women who work in home care, nursing home cleaning services, and so on. So, and also psychological burden uh, for for due to the school due to school closure and uncertainties on the economic uh, income. Um, this can exacerbate also some health, um, uh, mental health uh, problem and disease. So, generally speaking, COVID-19 has exacerbated uh, the problems and also uh, um, strengthened uh, the, the difficulties and the barriers uh, in accessing healthcare for those subgroups of populations. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to each of you for this very insightful. Um, thoughts and also ideas and I think they give us a lot of already food for discussion for the breakup rooms so without further ado uh, so we will have four breakup sessions the information has been shared with you previously so you can access the links in the webinar breakup room information section and uh, after that you will have to come back to this uh, to the same uh, aircast studio environment so if there are any questions, just please feel free to get in touch with, uh, with the colleagues who are providing assistance. And thanks again, everyone, for their participation. Okay, I think we can get started. So thanks very much, everyone. And I would like to hand it over to the rapporteur of the group discussing supporting the mental health needs of migrant women and access to support services. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, first of all, let me thank all the participants to the breakout session because it was a really uh, rich discussion and also uh, um, we, are, are we live? Yes. Yeah, okay. A rich discussion and, uh, and also stimulating. Um, yes, very briefly because we got only one, two minutes just to, to, to report. Um, in our uh, breakout station, we have been discussing about the the meaning of the of the of the meaning of the cause uh, in mental health uh, um, problems. What 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 I refer to cause, I mean the the, the way uh, foreign people they, they normally um, tr try to explain and to express uh, the problems of mental diseases, mental illness, mental mental um, distress and so, on, and so on and so on. So it is important uh, to, to really understand the, the mean, real meaning of, the, of the, 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 the distress. It's important to understand what codes are about. And in order to do that, it's needed, um, you know, a training, a training and uh, of uh, healthcare and um, uh, healthcare pr providers uh, because they have to be ready and uh, uh, sometimes the um, the national calls are not enough and uh, sometimes uh, you know uh, it's very difficult for the operators to understand the needs and also it is difficult for uh, the women uh, who uh, have some you know, uh, distress from mental distress to express, uh, you know, properly uh, their needs and their problems because there is not very, very clear and smooth communication on these specific issues. And another point, uh, it, it, it has been really recognized as important is that mental 
illness uh, is not uh, only a personal problem, uh, but when you face the mental illness or something you think is like, you know, a mental disease or a mental disorder, you have to um, involve the community, the community where the migrant lives and uh, the, 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 the woman is, uh, so the family and also uh, the, the, the community, because it is something which has to be accepted, first of all, and not um, and not, um, you know, um, given um, given um, uh, to to the to the person. Otherwise, th th there will be a reaction, a counter reaction in uh, accepting, you know, help uh, and also to uh, to undergo a specific path. And the third uh, the third point is, uh, you know, the, the importance of ethnopsychiatry. Uh, in the in the uh, in the in the uh, health, uh, mental health services, public and private mental health services, because uh, once again um, the instruments and, uh, and and the skills and the capabilities of operators are really essential to uh, to be um, culturally oriented and culturally sensitive, uh, and in mental health terms, uh, it's uh, even more more difficult. Thank you. Over to group two with Jennifer, please. Yes, again, a great uh, discussion with the, with the participants. A uh, couple of points. Um, the learnings because of the forced virtual delivery that the pandemic has forced us into may actually be resulting in some benefits uh, around people being able to access health professionals in other parts of the country. So particularly thinking of SOGI newcomers who may not have health professionals uh, that are sensitive and aware of the transition that they're, they're uh, going through. But also uh, in terms of language classes, people might not have felt uh, comfortable going into a language class if they were particularly a trans individual. Uh, so therefore how uh, the, the virtual delivery maybe opened up some more space for them to, to participate in programs, as well as with women who may have childcare uh, uh, um, uh, you know, responsibilities. Again, the virtual delivery is enabling people to access programs. Obviously, there would need to be an evaluation about the actual impact and learning outcomes over a long period of time, but it does raise uh, an opportunity to for learning around what does that virtual delivery mean and can we support that in making sure people have the technical equipment and access and digital literacy skills to be able to do it. Also looking at the importance of training health professionals, which I think was already mentioned, uh, that ongoing training and awareness is critical. Uh, and also not only with healthcare professionals, but also with interpreters and particularly working with SOGI newcomers, how that is really critical that uh, it's not just the staff at a settlement agency, the health professional, but the interpreter that walks in that room uh, is, is able to, uh, that the person who is, who is there is able to feel comfortable and supported and safe in that environment. So there's a holistic approach to how that, that those meetings and those, those engagements need to happen. I think the other thing we heard from, our, from our, the participant in Portugal as well was an, a, kind of an amazing program that uh, looked at uh, female genital uh, cutting and how to approach that, not from a crime base or a, uh, uh, you know, uh, the appropriateness, a culturally appropriateness uh, view, but from a health perspective, and that that really opened up the opportunity for people to feel comfortable coming forward, and also for health professionals to be able to engage at that level. So again, it's the, the, the culturally appropriate way to engage with newcomers around uh, uh, health services that they need and require and understand, so the training, but also the invitational way of doing that is really important and it actually brings forward more people, in this case more women coming forward in terms of having questions. It's not, uh, uh, um, it's, it's, it's a more of an open forum to be able to deal with that. I, I hope I'm expressing that, uh, that well, you. but just very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I would like just to ask Emin, because we have very few minutes, I mean, can you please just give us two major points of your panel? Our session addressed violence and um, specifically human trafficking, FGM, were uh, topics which were discussed in the session. 
uh, two important things is uh, an advice actually also to the group is that sometimes there's contradiction between different government policies for instance when it comes to irregular migrants and helping uh, women who are uh, victims of trafficking who sometimes are so it's very difficult to call for help that's one of the things and resources are important the other thing is language language is also a source of uh, isolation um, and especially in the situation of Canada in Toronto uh, French language is also language so there are less resources to help with language education so please take that away take that uh, also as an advice the other thing uh, an advice on disability. Uh, a lot of women and girls with disabilities, sometimes invisible disabilities, are at high risk to become victim of uh, trafficking. So uh, there are a lot of barriers. Take that into account. And last but not least, engage when it comes to working with communities and, and policy makers, engagement. That's very important, for instance, on the issue of FGM. And if you want to involve communities in right at the beginning and not later on when all the uh, decisions are taken. So much. And over to Alisa in 30 seconds, please, Alisa. Okay, thank you. So uh, we were speaking about uh, domestic violence and uh, we all agreed that it was necessary to assess the situation in order to be able to address it properly. Uh, so we talked about uh, the issue of violence, normalization, psychology and isolation uh, of migrant women that uh, creates more risk. And so we say that prevention was a good idea to, to tackle that um, and talk about stereotypes and fight against them uh, from a young age. So both uh, sex roles links to women, but also uh, to men, to enable them to communicate and to act in a more caring and less violent way. Uh, we also talked about mediation uh, that is used to um, create bridges between different culture and to try and tackle this issue. Um, and we say that it was relevant to involve uh, people from the community uh, in these kinds of mediation in order to create a sense of trust. Uh, then we talked about the issue of legal status that can create dependency for women to remain with a violent partner. Uh, so in Canada, apparently, uh, there were new legis legislation uh, saying that um, uh, the woman that came from uh, for family reunification doesn't need to stay uh, with a violent partner. So that's a good practice. Uh, then we talked about language barrier, administrative barrier, and we decided that education and information was the best way to, to tackle this. And finally, we discussed uh, the fact that past experience and trauma, like uh, female genital mutilation, sexual violence, and so on, can also have an impact. So service providers working with migrant women need to be trained on this issue. I hope thank I was. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank everyone, including the panelists and everyone who has worked behind the scenes. Uh, I know uh, virtuality brings with some challenges. But I think we have come to very good and very insightful discussion. So I would like to thank everyone for also their patience and understanding. And just a last point to invite everyone uh, to the high level event with the European Commissioner for Migration uh, and Home Affairs, Mrs. Johansson, and the Canadian Minister for Immigration, Mr. Mendoncino, on 18 December to mark the International Migrant Day and discuss the outcomes of the series of webinars on integration of migrant women. And with all of this, I just would like to then wrap up and would like to wish everyone a good continuation of the day and also a good weekend. Thanks very much.